be. Sure. Here we are for uh, August 30th. Oh my goodness. It's September, day after tomorrow. My goodness sake, it goes quick. And we are here for um, Social Styles Part 2. Um, hope everyone uh, did their homework assignment and has their participant package. And we're going to get started uh, with our instructor this evening is, is uh, Bev Green, again, our, our certified or certifiable <laughs> facilitator. Uh, we're going to, uh, uh, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand by using the uh, blue hand on the at the bottom of the participant page and click on that. I'll monitor that. And I'll also keep an eye on chat if you have a question that you want to ask. But otherwise, unless I interrupt her, Bev's just going to keep on going. So we are ready to go. Bev, uh, it's all yours. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming back for part two. This is absolutely the more fun part than part one was. Um, a couple challenges in part two is one, we were supposed to have a Tinker Toy experiment, which I cannot do over Zoom. Um, and the other was there were a couple times when we were all supposed to break out into, um, you know, special little groups of four, uh, one of each style, and it became impossible to figure that out. So um, we're, we're adjusting a little bit to make it really interesting, really productive, and um, we will be using chat, and I will ask you to raise your hand if you have a question. David will be monitoring, monitoring the hand raising. And I want to make sure that everybody filled out their questionnaire. I'd hold it up to the screen, but I don't think you can see my screen. Anyhow, there was a behavior styles questionnaire from last week that you added up your totals um, to see where you fell within the four quadrants. And then there was also a versatility um, score. So just briefly, and this goes back to a question we had last week with Janet, which is, um, I'm no, not just one, I'm all four of these. And my guess is everyone, without a doubt, came up with scores at the bottom of each of those four columns. So one of the things I'm going to ask you to do is go to page three before we get really started. Go to page three in your handout and put down in order of uh, highest number first, which of the styles you came in at. So the first one is either going to be driver, analytical, expressive, or amiable. So put them in order of what came up at the top. And so you'll have four listed. We're going to go back to that. Just want you to have that in your mind. If anybody has a question, let me know. I'm going to give you a minute to do that. Okay. Excuse me, Bev. You said page three of tonight's handout? Yes. There's a backup style page that has yes. the quadrants on it. And there's notes on the right. Just add them right in there. Oh, I see. Just, that, just list. Just put them in the notes on the right. Yeah. Um, I wanted to do that at the very beginning and then we'll go right back to that. So the first thing I want to do is review just a little bit um, if there were any questions from last week. Um, and this was a very odd slide, I thought. Um, I didn't write these courses. These were written for us. Um, and I want to use chat for this. So the first thing is, um, which style do you think is the overriding primary style uh, for someone who is adamant about dealing with time? So think about it or chat it. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. But um, I just want to look at, you know, if you're looking at time, you're probably looking at an analytical or a driver, somebody who really wants to keep things on schedule. Analytical, okay. So the next one, tone of voice. Um, type in chat, please, which dominant style you think would be really concerned about the tone of voice. Expressive came up twice, okay. We'll go to the next one, shake hands. Who's gonna be most 
concerned with shaking hands. Amiable, okay? Deal with change. Driver. Now it doesn't say deal well or not deal well. It didn't qualify that. Um, it just says deal with change. Okay, fashion and clothes. Okay, somebody did say analytical when it came to deal with change. So that wasn't all driver. Okay, expressive. Um, make decisions. Who's gonna be most concerned about making decisions? Driver, driver, all right. Uh, who's gonna be most uh, influenced by body language? Expressives or amiable, all right. Um, in a group setting, who's gonna be most comfortable? Amiable, all right. Full agreement on that one. Who's gonna be most willing to take a risk? Driver, driver, analytical driver, okay? And who's gonna be most uh, ready to engage a team? Amiable, driver, amiable. Okay, so that just got all those little bits and pieces um, back in your head of which styles are which. So, Today's lesson, we're going to understand the backup styles. We're going to look at the group member's social style. We're going to understand the choices for increased versatility, identify the impact that stress has on social styles, not that any of us are under stress these days, and develop an action plan for working with others. So, and in the very back of your handout is an appendix for clarity of the four styles. I think you all have a pretty good handle on it but just know for reference it's there. So first thing we're gonna do is review your scores on the right that you just wrote down. So if you go to page three, if you've written down your scores as to what your primary style was, and I'm gonna ask you to kind of raise your hand, um, who was surprised? And, or chat. Um, Dave, can you see the hands going up? David, I can't hear you. Okay, I don't see any blue hands coming up. Oh, here you go, Gerald, go ahead. Why were you surprised, Gerald? You have to unmute yourself, Dave, Gerald. Hello, Gerald. I mute him. I tried. There, go. Okay. All right. Yeah. The uh, I was uh, highest in expressive, and I thought it'd be more in the driver. So wow. Okay. Who else was surprised? I, I couldn't hear Gerald's uh, comment, Biff. He said he came up highest in expressive, but he thought he would come up as a driver. Now, Gerald, was driver your second highest score? Uh, actually, no. Um, uh, analytical. Okay. Driver was my lowest score. Okay. And uh, amiable was my third. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on if they were surprised? No? Okay. What we're gonna look at is your backup style because none of us are pure. And this goes back to what Janet was asking uh, last week is that I'm, ne I'm not just one of those and none of us are, none of us are that simple. I will tell you that I took this test four years ago, first time, and I did it again yesterday and my order did not change. The scores changed, the values changed. Um, expressive went down by eight points. The other ones went up to make up the difference, um, except driver went even down further, <coughs> which tells you I'm not in the workforce as often in charge of meetings because that went away. So um, now that you know where you fall, there's an additional thing. 
<clears throat> because they're subdivided. So what we're going to look at, oops, first is the driver. <clears throat> and what those stand for in the very top outside corner is, of course, the extreme. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me for one second. So what you've got in the upper right is a driver driver. Just to the left of that, you have an analytical driver. Below the analytical driver, you have an amiable driver. And to right of that, you have an expressive driver. So these are all the four quadrants. And so what they're saying is, of course, none of us is, I, I doubt very many would have scored 100 or even 90% of their point totals in an outside corner. Analytical, right. Comment? Right. Yeah, that's right. Somebody said something. Oh, I'm not muted. Yes, I agree. Okay. Sorry. Can I keep going? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so if you're looking at page three in your book, you can see that, you know, this is the analytical side. We have the analytical, analytical in the upper left, of course, is your extreme, and then driver analytical to the right, amiable analytical below, and expressive analytical below that, uh, or below the driver. So what these are breaking up, if you remember the quadrants we had, um, the quadrants from top to bottom are control or show, and the quadrants from left to right are ask on the left and tell on the right. So what we're looking at is, not, I'm, I'm guessing nobody's gonna fall in the outside corners. Nobody's an expressive expressive, maybe they are. Um, but I, what I want you to do is circle where your scores fell. So the second most score, if it was amiable and the top score was driver, you are an amiable driver. So you, that is what you will circle. If your top score was a driver, I'm sorry, if your top score was expressive and let's say your next highest score was analytical, you're an analytical expressive. So I'd like you to, on your sheet, circle whichever belongs to you, okay? So certain quadrants seem to attract certain careers simply because people attracted to those careers um, use the strengths in each quadrant. We hope that you're in a job, if you are, or retired and enjoying, um, things that, that point to that quadrant. So, you know, accounts, engineers, analytical, of course. Um, so I'm going to ask, and I'm going to ask you to chat. It's the, the question on the, on the survey says, what occupations? And I'm going to say, what board positions? Because we are all leaders within our course. So either board positions or course positions, if you have different people that are active during your rehearsal nights, um, what board or course positions attracts, um, let's do amiables first. Uh, and please chat uh, the answer to that question. Anybody has a board position, amiable membership? Membership, membership, membership. Okay. Marketing? Marketing? Membership. Okay, does anybody have any comments about the fact that they think marketing and membership, and of course the social sunrise person um, would be the amiable one? Any comments? Anybody raising their hand to comment? No, no blue hands coming up. Okay, so we're gonna go to the next one, which is what board position, and I'm doing these in no specific order, what board or course uh, position of responsibility, leadership position, um, would be best served by a driver. Hmm. <laughs> I heard a laugh. That must have been David. President, president, music director, program VP, okay. President, director, music team. How about committee? chair? I know that wasn't an option, but um, that also might be somewhere where a driver would work. Uh, 
committee maybe who's looking for a new place to sing because you can't use your old place, uh, which is very possibly right now. Ways and means chair, okay, for those of us that have them. All right, I'm gonna go on to the third. I'm gonna pick expressive for this one, uh, board positions or chorus positions of leadership, do you think would be expressive? Best served by an expressive? Marketing, music team chair, choreo, there's a good one, choreo. Director, performance team, VP of music. Looks like he needs to be a pretty roundabout person. Performance. All right, it's slowed down. The fourth one that I hadn't said anything about was analytical. Uh, might be a little easier to peg this one. If you want to, treasurer, secretary, treasurer, music, VP, <clears throat> treasurer, okay, coach. How about the show chair? Best described by an analytic person who gets it all done and planning. Okay, there's a planning, so that would work. Um, any comments? Raise your hand or speak up, David. I haven't seen any questions, any hands coming up for okay. questions. There he's going. I have to tell you that I tied for the middle two scores, which really surprised me. Um, fundraising chair. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next page in your, I think you guys kind of have a feel for the impureness, for lack of a better term, of exactly where you fall. Um, and this is put up here to remind you of the vertical and horizontal limits. Um, way on the left is an ask in assertiveness, not really. You're going to ask, you're very seldom going to be very assertive. Uh, to the right is the tell, a person with high assertiveness issues, not issues, but um, what word do I want? Uh, tendencies. Uh, for the control, for the responsiveness, the control is at the top, the driver and analytical are absolutely more control type personalities than the amiable and expressive, which are very much more show type personalities. So as long as you have that in your head, um, this is where it's going to get a little strange. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute so I can see everybody a little more easily. I can find the cursor. Okay, come on. I have two screens, and when I put this slideshow up, the screens get really strange, so I apologize for the weirdness of... I can't find it. There we go. Nope. Why can I stop, not stop my share? David, can you stop my screen share? Oh, there we are. I got it. Sorry. Somebody talk. Okay. There we go. There we go. We'll cheat a little bit. Okay. So for this first part, I'm going to pick on some people I know. Um, I'm going to pick on Don Fusen first. Would you please <laughs> unmute yourself and uh, say hello and tell us very, very briefly something about yourself. Uh, hi. Hello. <laughs> uh, very briefly, something about myself. Uh, I joined Barbershop uh, after I retired from Bell Labs. So I'm kind of a, um, a planner, an analytic driver kind of person on the side. And, uh, but I've been singing all my life and I very quickly got involved in chapter leadership, district leadership, international okay. kind of stuff. Okay, part two of this, if I had just met you and went up and uh, put my arm around you, what would your reaction be? I would put my other arm around you. Okay, question number three. Um, how comfortable were you when I called on you to speak? 
Um, it's fine because I've done a lot of, of group facilitations and everything. You have to make yourself a little bit uh, vulnerable to help help the group and help yourself. Okay, Don, keep um, your your speaker on, but I want everybody to chat and say, where do you think you would put Don as far as his group assessment? And if you look at page four, you can see the four categories, driver, analytical, amiable, or expressive. And if you wanna get go into the backup style, do that. So we've got driver analytical, we've got an amiable. Does anybody have other comments? What do you think of Don? Driver analytic, okay. Amiable analytic, couple more. Analytical, amiable, all right. Driver analytic, I'm gonna stop it there for time because this is fun. I hate to stop. Uh, Don, will you share with us how you came out as your scorecard? Uh, on this particular one, driver was my highest, uh, very closely followed by expressive. Analytical was kind of in the middle, and this one, gosh, I, I have to slap myself, my amiable score was uh, far below. Okay, well, <laughs> those of us who know and love you would disagree with that, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, what this tells us is two things. One is, this is really hard to do on Zoom, I apologize. It would be so much easier to do in front of a group, um, but we got to make do. It's also tells us that a short glance into a person's personality may or may not be, we may be good at it, we may not be good at it, or this is just too short, but I'm going to do it again. This time I'm going to pick on Alan Lampson. I saw you check in. I know you're here. Don, if you put your, yep, and Alan, if you take your phone off mute, I'm going to ask you to give us a very brief intro. Please. 40 year barbershopper, past president, chapter, district, society, um, and love to sing. All right. Question number two is the same one Don had. Uh, if I walked up behind you and uh, because you're in front of a room and put my arm around you to kind of guide you to a different spot, what would your reaction be? Unlike Don, I would put both arms around you, Bev. <laughs> Okay, I know these two guys, so let's go with that. Uh, your question number three, um, how would you feel if you were asked to take over a meeting? No problem, no problem. Okay. I don't even have to know what the topic is, Bev. Okay, so with that, I would like everyone to chat how they think Alan's scores came up as far as controller show, you're looking at page four, you've got the topics, or ask or tell. Um, how you feel about it? Okay, driver, amiable. Um, driver, amiable driver. High on control, driver, amiable. Driver, expressive. Looks like they've pegged you as a driver, Alan. Expressive driver, okay. What were your scores? Will you share them with us, please? Yep. Uh, the highest score was driver. <laughs> All right, everybody. You got it right. Yeah. And the second highest score was amiable. Okay. Well, either you were easier to read or you told us what we needed to know to read you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pick on David, whom I do not know that well. Uh, and I'm sure some of you don't know David. Um, so, David, would you give us a brief introduction about yourself? I'm uh, a 60-year barbershopper. I joined when I was 15 years old in 1960. I've seen an awful lot of change in the society. I've, up until the last few years, I've been pretty much on the music side of everything. Uh, I've done a lot. I've been in the judging program, directed choruses, second quartets. In the last few years, I've uh, taken a board position for the Northeastern District, and I'm having uh, a mysteriously satisfying time doing this. And uh, I, I'm not really sure why I'm, on, why I'm enjoying it, but it's more of a challenge. But I'm finding that I'm having a good time and seem to be doing a good job at it. All right, my next question for you, same as the others. If I walked up to put my arm on your back to move you to a different spot, 
in front of a room, how would you react? I would immediately put my arm around your waist and uh, follow your lead. All right. Question for you is, um, if you're called on unexpectedly in a meeting to answer, what's your first reaction? Not what you say, but what's your first reaction about being called on? I would have to make sure that I say what is in my head rather than try to make something up. But I would be cautious if I'm not familiar with the subject and would couch my remarks a little bit, I guess, or pull a punch or two, but it would depend on what the topic is and what my knowledge is of it. Okay, it's uh, your turn, everybody else. Please chat and tell me what uh, group assessment, assessment, what style uh, and backup style you think David falls under. Analytical expressive, one, two, three in a row. <laughs> um, four. <laughs> Uh, amiable analytical. All right. Slow down a little bit. Now I'm not looking at who's sending these, so. Yeah, I'm watching that too. So I have no clue talk, whether you know him well or not. I'm so, going to have to talk to a few of these people. Uh, I think. David, would you uh, share with us, please, how you scored? Uh, analytical, far and away. Driver second, expressive, then amiable. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to pick on Glenn. Are you here? I don't, I can't see you on the screen. Is Glenn? I, I don't believe Glenn is on the call yet at this point. All right, let me pick on somebody. You pick someone, David, someone we don't know. Oh my goodness sake. Uh, don't know. Lynn Graysuck. Okay, Lynn, if you will unmute yourself, please. A trusted friend. Yeah, thanks a bunch, David. <laughs> oh, I said someone you don't know. <laughs> okay, he doesn't pay attention sometimes. Okay, um, would you give us a very brief uh, description of yourself? Um, I have been in barbershop longer than I feel I have. It all always feels new to me, like I'm always learning. Um, I am... Uh, a, a vice president in my in my day job, and I have strong writing skills that I use a lot. Okay, uh, Lynn, if I came up behind you uh, in front of a room and put my arm around you to kind of move you to a new position, how would you react? I would suffer it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the third question I have for you is, um, how would your reaction be if I asked you to take over a group unexpectedly on a subject you may or may not be familiar with, but to just take over? It'd be fine. I do it all the time. Okay. Uh, I will ask the group now um, to respond as they are already typing. Expressive analytical, amiable, expressive, expressive driver, driver amiable, driver analytical. We've now gotten all four categories in there. Um, Driver expressive, amiable analytical, expressive amiable. You're a little harder to read with those three questions in that introduction, um, which is fair. I mean, we gave you all of two minutes. So would you share with us um, how you scored yourself? My scores uh, came out as analytical expressive. Okay. Um, but, well, I do, but I do feel like Janet that um, even though the scores, oh, the scores were relatively close across the board, and I think I do morph, um, I do morph a lot. Morph? Yep, I can change, I can change my, 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 my way of being depending upon the circumstance. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this part? I thought that was kind of fun. Um, this gives you a, a kind of way to understand who you're speaking with or reacting with and how they're going to work with you. John, John Englander has a question for you. Go ahead, John. Yeah, Bev, uh, when we've been going through this, uh, <clears throat> we've said your high score is the category you're in, second highest is your subcategory. But four of the quadrants are driver, driver, amiable, amiable, etc. How would you end up in one of those categories? Oh, if your score was like so far above everything else. Uh, uh, how, about how far above? 80, 80, 42. What was that again? 
about how far or above? I mean, I, significantly, probably like 50 or 60 points between the top two. Okay. They have to be huge because the scores total is 160, yeah. 60, 300. A lot of 300 points approximately. Um, you would have had to have a huge disparity of that top score. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe 180 or something. I would be surprised. Do you find yourself in one of those four corners? Uh, well, I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Uh, I had a high score of 117, uh, no. 70, 69, and 44. No, that's absolutely within a, a very easy range of you are not a, a, a quad. Nobody really. I, I, I can't say nobody. That's not fair. Very few people would find themselves on the very outer edges. Now you may circumstantially find yourself out there if you're in charge of a meeting that you're getting absolutely nowhere with and you just roll into that tendency. Um, because your tendency is to stay within your comfort zone first, but we're gonna get towards the end of this, we're gonna see how you're gonna shift out of that to make progress. You can't stay in your comfort zone if you're not getting anywhere and you're in charge of the meeting. Okay, thank you. 117 is well within normal. Yes, Don, that's how your hand goes. Oh, I think it's really important. Lynn said something that I, I scribbled down over here if I can remember the context, uh, but really morphing as you go in all these external variables that you respond to in one case and then another case you may not, who knows. And so we really don't know how other people react to various things unless you engage in an exercise like this or just conversations to get to know them. And so it's very difficult to, you know, join a group, take over a group or whatever, and, you know, really know where everybody's coming from, know where their experience, know where their unintended biases lie. And that's the challenge of leadership, so. I'm glad you said unintended biases. We don't understand those. And understand also that your biases may or may not be visible to other people. And you may or may not expose your true personality to other people depending on the situation. So as we are the, we, we are always the audience um, to other people unless you get to know them really well. So everything we see, we saw, you know, Alan was pretty easy. I don't know if that's because everybody knows Alan or he just gave the answers to make it obvious. Um, everybody pegged Alan, but nobody else had, a, there wasn't a huge consensus over everybody else. So people may perceive us in ways that might surprise us. All right. And there is no, there is no right or wrong. It's your comfort zone. Hopefully where you like, where you find yourself in leadership positions as a good, good fit and oftentimes has to be on a board of directors or a play a leadership role, getting a good fit is huge because if we're outside our comfort zone, we're not gonna be as effective. If, if we are, the best thing to do is coach someone along within their comfort zone and sort of outside, we're gonna go look at how to get outside and where you're gonna go. Um, did anybody find themselves, we did have one person, um, not in agreement with the answers you got from your questionnaire on that first part. We heard from one person, but that was it. Okay, we're gonna take, uh, it might've been enlightening, but not surprising. Uh, how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, this is just a quiet question, put on a mask so the group doesn't see you, how you really are. This is certainly done more in person uh, than on a Zoom session. We're all pretty comfortable, I think, with Zoom and whatever personality we want to put out there. Um, we see and focus on different aspects of an individual. A lot of times when we're in a meeting, we're looking for a kindred spirit. We're looking for someone who we can connect with, who might be our backup support, whether they know it or not, in a situation where they're going to have our back if we need it, or they can diffuse the situation if we need it because they understand us. So it does make a difference if you understand who is on your team. If you don't, 
it's a real good exercise to kind of get a feel for what your personalities are when you're working with people. Now, the next thing that was in the scheduled workshop had to do with Tinker Toys. Well, that's not gonna happen. So what I'm gonna do is share my screen with you and we're gonna watch a seven minute TED talk. Um, and I don't know if any of you have seen it or not. It's called Build a Tower, Build a Team. And if you'll see that I've got the link on one of your slides. So when you get the slides, you'll have the link to this. If you haven't already seen it, it's about a marshmallow challenge. Um, anybody in my view, raise your hand if you've seen this before. Uh, if not, um, Alan has done, okay, I've seen three, four, five hands, but I don't have everybody on my screen. Um, sit back and enjoy, and six minutes long, I am getting interrupted a couple times. And so first I need to share my screen. And this is the screen. Here at TED, Peter Skillman introduced a design challenge called the Marshmallow Challenge. And the idea is pretty simple. Teams of four have to build the tallest freestanding structure out of 20 sticks of spaghetti. You can't one, see the, the screen, Bev. And the marshmallow. The marshmallow has to be on top. And though it seems really simple, it's actually pretty hard because it forces people to collaborate very quickly. And so I thought this was an interesting idea, and I'm hoping to a design workshop. Can you restart it then? Thank you. Yes. And since then, I've conducted about 70 design workshops across the world with students and designers and architects. Even okay. I heard you. It just took me a while to fight my screens to get it started. Sorry about that. Okay, we're going to try this one more time. Share screen. This is the screen. Share. There we go. Full screen. Peter Skillman introduced a design challenge. Okay. The marshmallow yep. challenge. And the idea is pretty simple. Teams of four have to build the tallest freestanding structure out of 20 sticks of spaghetti, one yard of tape, one yard of string, and a marshmallow. The marshmallow has to be on top. And though it seems really simple, it's actually pretty hard because it forces people to collaborate very quickly. And so I thought this was an interesting idea and I incorporated it into a design workshop and it was a huge success. And since then I've conducted about 70 design workshops across the world with students and designers and architects, even the CTOs of the Fortune 50. And there's something about this exercise that reveals very deep lessons about the nature of collaboration and I'd like to share some of them with you. So normally most people begin by orienting themselves to the Sorry. The task. They talk about it. They figure out what it's going to look like. They jockey for power. Then they spend some time planning, organizing, they sketch in, they lay out spaghetti. Uh, they spend the majority of their time assembling the sticks into ever growing structures. And then finally, just as they're running out of time, someone takes out the marshmallow and then they gingerly put it on top and they stand back and ta da! They admire their work, but what really happens most of the time is that the ta-da turns into an uh-oh because the weight of the marshmallow causes the entire structure to buckle and to collapse. So there are a number of people who have a lot more uh-oh moments than others, and among the worst are recent graduates of business school. <laughs> it's amazing. They lie, they cheat, they uh, get distracted, they, and they produce really lame structures. And of course, there's teams that have a lot more ta-da structures. And among the best are recent graduates of kindergarten. And it's pretty amazing, as Peter tells us. Uh, not only do they produce the tallest structures, but the most interesting structures of them all. So the question you want to ask is, how come? Why? What is it about them? And Peter likes to say that none of, the, none of the kids spend any time trying to be CEO of Spaghetti Inc., right? They don't time, spend time jockeying for power. But there's another reason as well. And the reason is that business students are trained to find the single right plan, right? And then they execute on it. And then what happens is when they put the marshmallow on top, they run out of time. And what happens? It's a crisis. Sound familiar, right? Okay, what kindergartners do differently is that they start with the marshmallow and they build 
prototype, successive prototypes, always keeping the marshmallow on top. So they have multiple times uh, to, to fix and to build prototypes along the way. So designers recognize this type of collaboration as the essence of the iterative process. And with each version, kids get instant feedback about what works and what doesn't work. So the capacity to play in prototype is, is really essential, but let's look at how different teams perform. So the average for most people is around 20 inches, business school students, about uh, half of that, lawyers, a little better, but not much better than that, kindergartens, better than most adults, who does the very best? Architects and engineers, thankfully. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop here for just a second. Can you hear me, David? Yes. Okay. Um, so, of these characters or sections they've already given us, uh, besides everyone, business school students, lawyers, engineers, kindergartners, um, where might you expect you would fall? Now, understand that this whole experiment was done with teams of four people. So, put yourself in a situation of maybe four people on the board, four people in your music team, for people uh, in the show performance team when you're getting ready to prepare a show and think of where you might have fallen, where you think you might have fallen in that experiment. So we're gonna keep going. 39 inches is the tallest structure uh, I've seen. And why is it? Because they understand triangles and self-reinforcing geometrical patterns are the key to building self-reinforced uh, uh, stable structures. So uh, CEOs, a little bit better than average, but here's where it gets interesting. If you put an executive admin on the team, they get significantly better. It's incredible. You know, you look around, you go, oh, that team's going to win. You can just tell beforehand. And why is that? Because they have special skills of facilitation. They manage the process. They understand the process. And any team who manages and pays a close attention to, to work uh, will significantly improve the team's performance. Specialized skills and facilitation skills, uh, the combination leads to, to strong success. If you have 10 teams that typically perform, you'll get maybe six or so that have standing structures. And I, I, I tried something interesting. I thought, let's up the ante once. So I offered a $10,000 prize of software to the winning team. So what do you think happened to these design students? What was the result? Here's what happened. Got worse. Not one team had a standing structure. Not one had, uh, uh, if anyone had built, say, a, a one-inch structure, they'd have even taken them the, the prize. So isn't that interesting that high stakes uh, have a strong impact? We did the exercise again with the same students. What do you think happened then? So now they understand the value of prototyping. So the same team went from being the very worst to being among the very best. They produced the tallest structures in the least amount of time. So there's deep lessons for us about the nature of incentives and success. So you might ask, why would anyone actually spend time running a marshmallow uh, challenge? And the reason is I help create digital tools and processes to help uh, teams build cars and video games and visual effects. Um, and what the marshmallow challenge does is it helps them identify the hidden assumptions. Because frankly, every project has its own marshmallow, doesn't it? The, the challenge provides a shared experience, a common language, a uh, common stance to build the right prototype. And so this is the value of the experience of this so simple exercise. And those of you who are interested may want to go to marshmallowchallenge.com. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Um, I'm going to go back to that screen. Uh, shared experience, common language, prototyping, and facilitation. Uh, not necessarily exactly what you would do in a meeting, uh, barbershop, but it certainly tells you how performance can be enhanced um, over time with experience, with better understanding of what the rules are, what the goals are, and also, if you can, how it was successful before. So one of the things that comes up with this, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, one of the items you can think about is, you know, how will this, especially if there's a new team put together, we've got, whether you've done it yet or not, um, you will have a team that says, how do we regroup after COVID? You've probably got a core team right now that says, what are we doing during COVID? Are you changing things up? Are we keeping our members? All that because we certainly are in 
stressful situations right now. Um, and uh, if anybody has any comments on this, uh, I would love you to raise your hand for a question or um, not necessarily how you're coping with what we are during COVID, but if you are getting ready to get teams together to approach the next challenge, which might be getting together again after COVID, or it might be um, maybe in Canada, you're better off than we are. Maybe you can rehearse in person now. I don't know. Um, courses are doing drive up, drive in, uh, keep your windows closed, drive in with uh, FM headsets on, just trying to keep things together. So think about how, knowing how your personality is, what people you will need on the team for this next big project. Um, if the next big project happens to be your quartet wants to sing out somewhere, then your quartet probably has at least three, possibly four, even if you're all bases, um, of these personality types, social types. Um, so you're all coming at it from a little different direction. So I wanna keep that in mind. Let me um, regroup on my screen here. So the next section, You just muted yourself, uh, Bev, and, and while you're quiet, uh, yeah. that exercise yeah. kind of points out the fact also that says you should fail earlier in a process, I guess, to give you more experience. Uh, you know, Alan will say that, uh, you know, from an architecture building point of view, you've got norms that if everybody knows those, you could probably put them together. But developing that set of norms and communications in a team uh, you know, people tend to think it'll come together quicker earlier than it does, and that's why we're, we normally run out of time. Always running out of time. Any questions, comments? Sorry about that little bit of music. I'm gonna share my screen, I'm gonna go back to the slideshow. And I can't see it. That's kind of weird. Do you guys have a slideshow up in front of you? No, we have a, a white screen, but no slides. What the heck happened? All right, let me try this again. How about now? Not yet. All right. I don't know why my computer is being fussy. I apologize. Share screen. That's what I want. There you go. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna go back to versatility on the form. Sorry. I have my notebook sitting on top of the the uh, keyboard. Um, at the end of your questionnaire, there was a second part and it was your versatility score. If you will go to page five of your handout and just put in your versatility score on that page. Mine happened to be 41. Um, you don't need to uh, tell us what yours is. Knowing your score is important. If you're less than a 36, Supposedly, uh, you need you could you could do to work on your versatility. Um, and uh, if I introduce the Young Millionaires Club to qualify as a member, you must have made your first million before your thirtieth birthday. This was before dot com companies. Membership is equally divided among four quadrants, but participants had higher than average versatility over thirty six. Direct participants to the versatility score on the social handout. I did that, okay. Versatility is the key to effectiveness. It describes one's ability to be flexible and adaptable depending on the situation and people involved. Skinner, B.F. Skinner, defined it this way. To situationally, purposefully, and temporarily modify my position one on one or both dimensions of behavior to create a win-win situation. 
So versatility is the avail availability to morph. I, somebody used that word earlier. Um, to get the communication across. The more versatile a person is, the more they can adapt to fit the receiver's needs. Remember, the only way to change communication results is to change the stimulus given to the receiver. Saying the same thing twice in a row is not probably going to change their response. Saying a different, saying it in a different way, or saying it differently emotionally may change their response. So that's what you're looking for. So we cannot group by social styles because we didn't know what they were beforehand. But um, page five on your handout gives you, I think, nope, I didn't, okay. Hang on. There's a page missing that I wish was here. I thought I put it in there. Um, so what you wanna do is to increase your versatility, you're going to move from whatever quadrant you found yourself in to a different quadrant. And because we know that the quadrants from the page before, the vertical quadrant is the control at the top and show at the bottom, if you want to de increase your emotional responsiveness, which was at the bottom of the page, where you're showing your more emotion, but you find yourself at the top, you're going to, if you're a control person, you want to increase your emotional responsiveness. If you are a show person and you need to get something done and you're not getting through to the people, you may need to increase your responsiveness by going more to the control side. Control your emotions, um, get more factual, just like the driver and analytical person would. Going on the left to right quadrant, which is ask on the left and tell to the right. If you are an ask person, so if you're amiable or analytical, if you want to increase your experience, excuse me, you're going to go to more of the tell side. You're going to take on some of the habits and um, not emotions, but um, manifestations of a driver or an expressive. And the same thing if you are a driver or an expressive, you want to move the other way and become a little more analytical or a little more amiable, depending on the situation. Does anybody have any questions about that? So to back up a little bit, and David, interrupt me if you want. Um, you develop your versatility to increase your responsiveness, focus more on the relationship and less on the task. To increase the control of emotion, you can focus more on the task less on the relationship, delegate more, focus more on objectives and less on the people because as an emotive, you will be focusing on people. Um, if you find yourself on the left side of the scale and you need to increase your expedience behavior, you can be candid, you can learn to deal with conflict more directly, you can take a stand if it's appropriate. If you find yourself on the tell side on the far right, to increase um, pro process behavior. You can uh, admit if you were wrong, you can negotiate rather than direct the answer. You can listen more and talk less. Those are just a couple ideas of how to become more versatile. And if I didn't add the notes I was just speaking from, I'll put them in the slideshow. What I wanna go to next is stress. So, the first line in my book says, ask people if they're experiencing some kind of stress. I hope you're all laughing because between work and school and kids and COVID, uh, yes, we're all under stress. So what this chart is gonna show you about zetting out or zeting out. And what it is is the preferred behavior I added in this the four uh, control, the control box to show where you're from. And what it is, is if you're a driver under stress, your first choice of movement will be to the left, which is to become a little more analytic. So if becoming more analytic doesn't get you where you need to go, 
it's not reducing your stress, it's not resolving any part of the situation. You will move back to the tell side, which is, sorry, which is where you're more comfortable. You went to the ask side for a while, you didn't get where you needed, you're gonna go back to the tell side, but you're gonna be more expressive. You're gonna pay attention more to the, to the, to what people are showing you rather than telling you. And after that, you will move to your furthest away quadrant, which is amiable. Um, this very much may or may not match the direction of your scores on that chart. For me, it did not, but I will show you that if you're an analytic under stress, you're gonna go first, you're gonna go to the tell side from the ask side. You're gonna go change your assertiveness first. If changing your assertiveness isn't enough, you're going to change your responsiveness to an ask position. And if that doesn't work, you'll change your responsiveness um, to a tell position. That is as far away from an analytic as you can get. Um, but that is your preferred, it is the, a typical response to stress and how the patterns, um, as stress increases, each quadrant goes through typical response. These are very typical. Um, under maximum stress, each quadrant moves through a Z pattern, ending up opposite to get it resolved. That's why this is called zetting out or zeting out, um, because you move in this direction. And an amiable under stress, again, you move along the assertiveness first, then you move along the responsiveness, and then you move along the assertiveness again to get to your opposite corner. And expressive under stress, the final thing they would try is to be very analytical. That is that part of it, the behaviors under stress. Um, here's a sample. I'm gonna read this. What time is it? 7.50, I have time to read this. Um, this is an example of zing out situation. Person A is a driver. The boss becomes angry with A because a project wasn't done on time, even though A was waiting for some input before A could finish. A's first reaction was to blow up at the boss and blame him. Of course, these examples are gonna be the extremes, so I apologize for that. If the problem isn't resolved, A moves left, assertiveness into the analytical avoid. He knew he, that he was right. It was his boss's fault the project wasn't done and A ignored the boss so that he wouldn't have to deal with the situation. If the stress continues to build, person A moves down to expressive and goes on attack. He puts his boss down while talking to other people and often finds his emotions running amok. As I read this again, these are extremes. Of course, if the project still isn't done, he is at a maximum stress and moves to the amiable acquiescence, meaning that A starts to worry about the project and decides he may as well do his portion and get the project done, but later would make his boss pay. Now, again, that is the extreme. Um, and these, again, are the extreme behaviors under stress. I'm pointing to my screen, you can't see me. Um, these are the behaviors under stress. Uh, a driver likes to dictate, likes to take over, likes to override his emotions. The first reaction would be to prove their right, to go to the details and say, I can prove this. Here, look at all these analysis. Look at this, look at this. It's, it's all here in black and white. If that doesn't work, they're going to go down to the show part. And for a driver, it will be directly below him because he stays within, you know, first he moves left, then he goes back and moves um, up and down. Um, he will try some expressiveness. And if none of that works, he'll become amiable, get it done, make sure it's finished, and then go back because he's a person who finishes stuff and then go back to who he is. So everybody goes through the stages, but the time spent may seem non-existent a lot of times. They have very people, we all have very varying tolerances for stress. So we move quickly or we move slowly or hopefully we move. Um, if you're looking at a person that you know their personality and they're starting to show, um, they're, they're starting to take on other 
behaviors that doesn't belong to their core personality, you know they're under distress. So then it becomes your job, if you are trying to mitigate the situation, understand that the stress is building and see if you can um, change the stimuli so the desired result is produced without totally allowing situations to get out of hand. So that is that part of it. Um, the last part, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if I can. Um, and again, this is quite a challenge. I can see the cursor. There we go. Okay. So that is the core of this course. Um, if you look at your... Bev, you're muted. You're at mute, Bev. You're still muted. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, the last page, the last three pages in your handout are appendix um, where, what the behaviors are and how to move them, what to expect, how to move them to the next thing. But before that, we have an action plan. So, and this goes directly to performances. <coughs> Again, I didn't write this um, class. But the action plan as a performer, which of course we all are, and we're going to use um, chat again. Uh, and that is, if you want to, the questions are, what's the purpose of an audience? Which is kind of a two-sided question for all of us. Um, the second question is, what do I need to be a better communicator? I think if we look at and understand, and especially read the last three pages of this handout, it certainly makes you more aware of other people's reactions and how to at least understand, at least, you know, the first step will be aware of the fact that someone is shifting their behavior. So therefore, they must be under stress and hey, I better pay attention. Whether or not you know exactly what to do is not the issue. The first learning part of this is recognizing that their behavior is changing so that there might be something you can do to help mitigate, help move them along to another quadrant. Um, or if it's someone you just are always disagreeing with, you can probably figure out why and how. Uh, maybe a different job, maybe a different committee uh, for you or them, either one. Um, maybe a talk on the side, uh, whatever it is you need to do, but to keep, since you'll be so aware of the reactions to people under stress, um, and of course now are extraordinary times, I think there's a book about that. Um, we can at least start thinking about how maybe even how better to have people fall into the right leadership positions. A lot of times our courses are warm bodies put in places because they're available rather than the right person for the job. And these social styles are things to hold under good consideration to make sure that the person you're asking to do something for you will be successful in their job. Um, and that was sort of off topic. So back to the action plan. What do we need to be a better communicator? Uh, certainly for shows as a performer. Um, you know which quadrant you can drop down into or who to grab to be a better communicator or performer. How do I communicate important ideas in the future with other members in a meeting in a quartet? Okay, those are a huge lot of questions that we cannot possibly answer right away. But I'm going to ask you to um, for some comments, either by chat. Don't start your set with three ballads. There you go. Get out of your box and perform across the footlights and listen for the reaction. OK. Uh, comments on chat or raise your hand. Take yourself off mute. I'll, I'll start, Bev. I yeah. was um, very interested in this uh, because I see myself going through these uh, Z patterns <laughs> in conversations uh, in, in my position as, as vice president in the district, as well as on the music team for Vocal Revolution. And I, I see myself in a better light because 
the frustration or the stress, I guess, uh, is that I need, I don't understand where they're coming from, what their mindset is. Not that what they're saying is wrong, it's just the way that they do it. And I realize that it's a conflict uh, between types, uh, behavioral types. But I, I really like this. I, I feel like I'm a little bit smarter. This is the better half of the two night presentation, yes. uh, I think. Um, yes. David, did you have something to say? Oh, you took yourself off mute. Anybody else? That was me talking. David Morgan. Oh. He's not on mute. Um, uh, anybody else have a comment or about the video? No. No comments? Yes. Actually, I, I find it really interesting because um, when I'm when I'm up against something as a director, I'm out front and I have tried saying things. I, I usually try to say things in about four or five, maybe six different ways so that everybody gets it. And if they're still not really getting it, but I'm starting to see reactions from individuals, um, this is, it's, it's very, it's helpful to be able to now notice that these are our stress reactions and not just, uh, well, I mean, I guess I already knew that they were stress reactions, but it was, but it's, it, it's nice to be able to realize where they're likely to go next if they're under that kind of stress. The other thing, remember, is that we learn by tactile, audio, or um, visual. So depending on what kind of learner they are, telling them five different ways, you may still not reach a visual learner unless you show them or unless they come down and model the behavior. Because, and I am a very visual person, um, and I get it. You can tell me maybe twice and I'll get it. But there's still times when it could be a more effective message if you were showing me. So, um, Gerald, you had something to say? Gerald, yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I believe you really met the objectives of this course very, very well. Uh, not only am I aware now of uh, my style uh, based on the exercise, but also to understand where other people are coming from and uh, it'll help you make a better better decisions as a group. The only thing, other thing I'd say, it'd be nice to have uh, all four styles, not the extreme, mind you, but all four styles on the team, on the leadership team. I'll just leave it at that, thank you. That's a good point. Great point. Yeah. Uh, point of frustration for sure, unless we're all aware. I think if you do do that, um, we are outside our comfort zone if we have all four types of people on a committee yeah. sometimes. So <laughs> if, you're, if you're intentionally doing that, it may be worth it to do a little part of this exercise uh, to let people know what their styles are or give them the questionnaire. So at least they understand a little better because otherwise I can guess there might be conflict because if you're, if you're an analytic, um, your comfort zone is absolutely with people that want numbers and answers and that's it. There's no, there's no uh, yep. wavering there. So. Comment on that? No? Uh, okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I, I just have to laugh because with every one of these, um, one, every one of these descriptions, I, I like immediately a member of my chorus springs to mind. <laughs> Well, that should make picking committees easier, right? Oh, yeah. We all know each other pretty well now. <laughs> That's wonderful. It would be an interesting experience. Um, the next one we do, actually, and I may pull this in, um, is after meeting audits. And I've never done social styles as one of the things we did during a chapter meeting. But it may be... We may revisit this uh, next time because I can see where that would be appropriate. Uh, we have next week off because it's Labor Day weekend. I hope everybody has a wonderful, safe, uh, exciting, um, get outside your front door, even though COVID's there. Although I guess up in 
maritime, maybe you're a little freer than we are down here. Uh, any other questions? And if not, we'll get the slideshow out to you. I wanna add one thing to the slideshow before I send it to David. Thank you all so much. This was a great fun piece. I hope you liked the video. Uh, just a, a note, you said to go outside. Uh, uh, in our email exchange, uh, Bev and I, uh, at the bottom of all of her emails is a quote that says, uh, go outside, especially when it's inconvenient. And I think that's, uh, that's a great therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Bev. And thank you everyone for participating. We'll see you in a couple weeks, hopefully. And uh, for the chapter, excuse me, the capability audit, they changed the title of the, of the module. Yeah, but, the, but the package still says essentially the same. And uh, so thank you again. And I will get the survey out tonight and the rest of the, the things tomorrow, the link for the uh, Zoom and the chat and so forth and the slideshow. So and thank you all. Oops. I'm going to put my email on this slideshow too. So if anybody wants to communicate privately, go ahead. And thanks again. This was fun. Great thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Nope. Stop the recording.